Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust, and I want to welcome you to the Salem Church Battlefield. We're out in part of Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. This is one of four historic structures that the park oversees within its limits, including Chatham Manor, where we started this morning. So if you haven't seen our earlier videos covering the Battle of Chancellorsville, or you missed our coverage of the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Fredericksburg last year, go over to our YouTube channel, check out everything we have in store for you. It's all free. Click the subscribe button, click that bell notification. You can also check us, uh, us out over at Facebook, like us there, and of course go to battlefields.org. Now today, what we've been doing is covering the eastern side of the Chancellorsville campaign. We've uh, started this morning at Chatham Manor, setting up the campaign. Uh, late this morning, we followed the Union assaults at a place called the Second Battle of Fredericksburg, fought right over that first battlefield that took place in December of 1862. We covered the May 1863 action, and now we've moved out to the Salem Church, which is about six miles to the east, I'm sorry, the west of Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg is in that direction, off to the east. Off to my left would be Chancellorsville, about six miles in that direction. And where we're standing is what's called Salem Church Ridge. This is the highest point between here and the Iberian Peninsula. So you go all the way across the Atlantic. Mikowski liked to drop that back at Zoan, or over at Zoan Church Ridge uh, in an earlier video, but in fact, this is the next closest one to Europe. So we're on high ground. In 1863, there was a church here, so you're looking at the historic church. We'll talk about that in just a moment. It sits along the Orange Turnpike. We're gonna go see that road in just a moment. That is a uh, modern day Route 3 that will lead you from Fredericksburg out to the west to a place called Chancellorsville, the battlefield there, then out towards Culpeper and Orange Courthouse where it'll split off to create Route 20 to go to Orange and take Route 3 out to Culpeper. And along this corridor, members of the American Battlefield Trust and our friends at the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust have saved a ton of land. Places like the Wilderness, Chancellorsville, out at Brandy Station at Culpeper, down to here at Fredericksburg. But unfortunately, the piece of land I'm about to show you is the exception to that rule. We're standing on less than three acres of National Park Service land, and I call this a dead battlefield. This is a battlefield that has been engulfed by modern development, and we'll show you that in just a moment, but it'll show you why we do what we do at the American Battlefield Trust. Uh, but before we get started, what I wanna do is set up where we are at Chancellorsville. It's May of 1863, May 3rd specifically. Off to my left throughout the morning from 5 a.m. until 10 a.m., there has been a hellacious battle. 17,000 casualties have been sustained between the two armies, between Joseph Hooker's Union Army and the Confederate Army of Robert E. Lee. It's one man for every second. Then we go over towards the Fredericksburg area. We've had a battle there at 2nd Fredericksburg, adding to that list of casualties. Finally, we'll have a battle here that is gonna add yet again to that casualty list. And by the end of the day, there's more than 21,000, almost, if, if not more than 22,000 casualties on May 3rd, 1863. The only day that sadly outpaces it is Antietam on September 17th, 1862. So as we're standing out here on this battlefield, this will be the uh, closing of the May 3rd action. More things will happen at Chancellorsville, but this is the closing to that day. Robert E. Lee, he is at the zenith of his power. He rides into the Chancellor's crossroads. One man said that in ancient times, this is how men rose to the dignity of gods. As he rides in with the Chancellor house burning behind him, men trying to, to cheer him as he goes into it. And as he hears about what's going on there, he doesn't know what's happening in the Union Army. Joseph Hooker's been wounded. He's been concussed. And he's been knocked out of action and his army is starting to fall back towards the Rapidan and Rappahannock rivers, establishing a final defensive line. In the meantime, Lee is aware of what's happening out to the rear. And that is out at Fredericksburg, we had a breakthrough of the Federals and we had a guy named Brother William from one of the Mississippi regiments who served in William Barksdale's brigade. He comes riding down this road as fast as he can. He goes to Robert E. Lee, who's just probably feeling pretty good about what happened. He's turning to land that killing blow on Joe Hooker. And here comes this guy just 
basically foaming at the mouth. He's got this tale of woe about how Jubal Early, Lee's bad old man, has been pushed off of the heights at Murray's Heights. And now there's 26,000 Union soldiers marching to our rear. We're going to be crushed between the two sides. And this will tell you what you need to know about Robert E. Lee as a battlefield commander. At this point, he's got three campaign victories, one defeat, one tie. He knows the man who's in charge of the Union men coming into his rear, John Sedgwick. In fact, Sedgwick, 49-year-old West Point graduate of the class of 1837, served under Robert E. Lee and the old 2nd U.S. Cav. Lee knew this guy. He knew him well. Lee tells brother William to go sit down and basically calm down for a few minutes. And he goes over, brother William sits down, and Lee walks over to him and asks him, you know, what's your story? And he tells him this tale of woe. And to paraphrase what Robert E. Lee says, he says, it's all well and good, but I believe that Major Sedgwick means us no harm. And it tells you two things. Number one, Lee's not taking the threat to his rear as seriously as you would think, or at least his brother William thought. But number two, he referred to Sedgwick as a major. That's how he served in the old army. And now, here's Lee looking kind of down his nose at this guy. He's like, yeah, I know how he is. I know how slow he is. He used to work for me. But Lee nonetheless has to react to this, to this um, dilemma. He'll start sending troops out here under the command of Lafayette McClaws, West Point graduate of the class of 1842. And then he's also going to start sending some troops out here under Richard Heron Anderson's division. Those will be led by little Billy Mahone. So we'll have troops coming towards where we're standing. In the meantime, from the west, in the meantime, coming in from the east, will be the 15th Virginia Cav, some artillery, but more importantly, Cadmus Wilcox's five Alabama regiments, who had been hanging out up at Banks's Ford to the north of us. And Wilcox hadn't found, seen really any action during the Battle of Chancellorsville. And on the morning of May 3rd, he wanders down towards, his, with his brigade down towards Fredericksburg. He shows up too late to participate in the second battle, but Lee loves men who will take calculated risks in his army. That's why he likes Longstreet, Jackson, Stewart, and others. Lee's taking many calculated risks during this campaign. And now Cadmus Wilcox is gonna take one. He's gonna take 1,800 Alabamians. He's gonna spread them out in a line and he's going to block the entire Union 6th Army Corps. He's going to try to slow them down in a delaying action. I want you to think back to, to Gettysburg, July 1st, 1863. Think back to John Buford. We talk about John Buford delaying hilltop to hilltop, ridgeline to ridgeline, until he gets back towards Gettysburg. It's exactly what Cadmus Wilcox is doing almost two months to the day earlier. Almost even never heard of it, heard of uh, uh, Cadmus Wilcox doing this. So in the meantime, this West Point graduate of the class of 46, he's trying to slow down John Sedgwick and this behemoth 6th Corps. And let's just be honest, the 6th Corps is not moving all that fast anyways, but they're coming this way. And he's going to fight a delaying action. We've got Confederates coming in this direction, and they know they have two defensible ridgelines. One at the Zoan Church, which was the break-off of the Salem Church. I'll tell you that story in a few minutes. And the Salem Church Ridge. And as Wilcox starts falling back to this area, he knows that there are prepared entrenchments here because George Pickett's division had spent part of the winter here and they had set up some entrenchments, but he also knows that help is on the way. So we have these two sides moving together to meet one another. On the federal side, we'll have leading the way a guy named William Brooks. He's in charge of the 1st Division of the 6th Corps. He's an Ohio native, West Point graduate of the class of 1841, and he's a bully. That's his nickname, Bully Brooks. Bully Brooks is coming out here with a division that is going to meet the enemy. The Union 6th Corps will be strung out all the way back towards Fredericksburg, and we'll be making a slow march out here towards Chancellorsville. To give you the idea of what the timetable was supposed to be, John Sedgwick was asked on the evening of May 2nd to march to Fredericksburg, break through the lines there, and arrive at Chancellorsville at dawn on May 3rd. It's three o'clock in the afternoon of May 3rd, 1863, and Sedgwick hasn't made it here yet. It's not going well for Joe Hooker. He's wounded, he's being bottled up, but this is an opportunity for Joe Hooker. Don't think Lee's won this battle yet. If Joe Hooker will wake up, literally, because he's been concussed and was knocked out, and launches an attack towards 
The Confederates who are around Chancellorsville, maybe 35,000 men are around Chancellorsville at this point. Hooker has 70-some thousand men. He could potentially crush that portion of Lee's army while Sedgwick keeps this portion, their uh, attention over here, and then you smash this between it. So the battle's not lost. And I want you to, to remember that. Stonewall Jackson and his wounding and the flank attack, that didn't end the Battle of Chancellorsville. That really started it. And the next day, Stuart and Lee have to put back that army together, and then they have to deal with this threat over here. And it's going to be a great day for the Confederacy when it comes to leadership in some levels. And it'll be a terrible day in others, mostly in the human carnage that will take place out here. And the Confederates will lose more than 9,000 men, including some of their best and brightest officers. And by the end of this battle, they're going to lose 64 out of their 130 regimental commanders. So as we take a look here, what I want to do is take a short walk. I'm not going to be the only one talking to you on here. we got Dan Davis, Sarah Byerly behind the camera. we got Tim Talbot from the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust. Chris Mikowski has gone off. We went to lunch, and I think he's had a few too many. Now he's actually taking his mom back, back home to Ohio. So what I want to do is show you why we do what we do here at the American Battlefield Trust. I want to tell you about the Salem Church, and I want to tell you about this battle. But first, as you come out here, this is a unit of Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. And it actually has four monuments out here. The Chancellorsville Battlefield has something like nine monuments on it. Uh, you come out to Salem Church, we have four. Um, so that's pretty impressive for this area. One's over here, placed in 1927 by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the UDC, as we call them. Um, they'll place uh, placards around the battlefields. Um, this is part of the Western Division, as they call them, who will put, the, put this in. Um, they'll put in these, these, these placards at places like the Wilderness, Spotsylvania. There was one at Chancellorsville, unfortunately, in the 70s. It was stolen. Um, there were other, other ones around. There's one at the end of the Sunken Road at Fredericksburg. Um, so they put these in, and they each tell a story about what happened at places. Um, sometimes it's, it's really interesting to read their interpretation uh, of, of it. Sometimes it's very very kind to the Yankees, and sometimes it's not so kind to the Yankees. Over here, we have another monument, and this was placed here on August 6th or 7th of 1903. Um, it was overseen by James Power Smith, but a man in New York gave $250 to place these monuments here, and I'll let Sarah swing around, that simply tell you things. Uh, we have a number of these. One says, Lee to the rear, cried the Texans in the wilderness. This one says Battle of Salem Church, May 3rd, 1863, Brooks, Ver Brooks and Newton. This is um, Bully Brooks and John Newton versus Wilcox and Sems, Cadmus Wilcox, Paul Sems, and down here, Little Billy Mahone. So this will give you an idea. This is actually very tall. Um, there's probably another four or five feet of this in the ground. Um, so it, it's actually very, very sturdy. There's two more. I'll point those out in a little bit to some New Jersey regiments. But as we stand here, it might get a little loud, I apologize. And um, this is what the Salem Church battlefield looks like. It has all been taken up by development. It's, uh, we have a CVS, Domino's, Atlantic Union Bank. We have churches. We have uh, down the road, a Texas Roadhouse. This is the old, or, old orange turnpike. The turnpike uh, toll house was down by where the Taco Bell is today. Um, and this is the reason why we want to preserve these battlefields. We, all, we have less than three acres of this battlefield here, and we'll get away from the road for you. But in the 1970s, the Park Service had an opportunity to purchase the land, some of the land around here. And whenever they were uh, quoted the price, it was $300,000. And when the appraiser came out here, they said it was, it was a, they were asking for 25,000 more than this land was valued at. This is the 1970s. The Park Service were only allowed to pay fair market value for something. So they could only pay for the appraised uh, value of this land. They couldn't go higher. The American Battlefield Trust, the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust, we didn't exist. So we couldn't come in and step in and try to help out and make up that $25,000. And unfortunately, this started a snowball effect. We start to see this, this effect with a gas station that was placed out here. Then a Rax will show up and then everything in between. There was an old Walmart just down the road. And unfortunately, this battlefield now is what we call a dead battlefield, or at least that's what I call it, because trying to preserve this and bring it back to life 
this would cost tens of millions of dollars to do so. But at the same time, this is a great example of what could happen if we don't step in to help preserve places out at the wilderness, Spotsylvania, Chancellorsville, or Fredericksburg and beyond. Um, so if you ever get a chance to come out here, <coughs> this place is hard to miss or hard to find because it's tucked in the woods, <coughs> excuse me, around a large intersection. And it's, uh, it's a, a great little spot. And before I bring Dan Davis on, I just wanna uh, tell you a little bit about the church. The church was founded in 1844, it was constructed. Um, uh, the church itself is, I think, 60 by 30, and uh, 60 feet by 30 feet. It's very simple. It has a number of doors on it. This would have been a uh, mixed congregation out here. You would have whites and blacks uh, both worshiping in the church at the same time, but they would not sit in the same, uh, they would not come through the same door. They actually had a separate door for the slave entrance, and they also had a slave gallery where you could go, they would go upstairs and have to look down upon the congregation, which probably in the wintertime was the better place to be because of the heat rising up there, because this is a small building. But nonetheless, the congregation at the time uh, before the war, I think it was about 77 people. Uh, let me check my notes real fast. Um, uh, don't mind me, I rarely work with notes. And yeah, it had 77 members in 1859. Uh, 20 of them were black. And then in 1861, we had 48 members, 20 of those were black. Um, but the church itself, the reason it, it's, it's constructed is because we had some Baptist church around here. We had one out at Wilderness, made famous during that battle. And then we had one down at Massaponics. There's another one down at Craig's Meeting House. Craig's Meeting House was actually founded by the people who own the Elijah Craig Distillery in Kentucky. So if you're a bourbon person, they lived here in Virginia before they moved to Kentucky. And then they decided they needed a church a little bit closer to town. They'll eventually get a Baptist church downtown, but they build this church. They get a, a few different um, um, uh, preachers to come through here. One of them would be John's Billingsley, the first one. They would only hold church here every other week uh, because Billingsley would oversee a couple of churches in this area and he would go between the two of them. And then um, in the 1850s, there's a split between the congregation. Some of them liked to drink, others didn't like to drink. There was a temperance movement going on. So the folks in the temperance movement went down the road and created the Zoan Church. You can see that in another one of our videos. The people who did drink were here at the Salem Church. And they would, um, uh, they stuck around here. Zoan Church actually, this created a rift in the congregation, created a, a huge rift in the congregation, to, in fact, because during the war, the Zoan Church is so devastated by war, they come to these folks here at Salem and said, hey, would you mind letting us use your, your church for worship? And they're like, nah, that's not gonna happen. Towards the end of the uh, 20th, or end of the 19th century, they actually, um, they'll actually uh, get back together and be friends because there's a fire at the Zoan Church and they allow them to use the Salem for a while. But this church is no longer in use uh, over here, we have the new Salem Baptist Church. It was constructed uh, in 1956 to 1958. They expanded in the 70s, and then they expanded in the 2000s. They've donated this church, I believe it was 1962, to the National Park Service. And every once in a while, the Park Service will have it open. You can come out here, you can learn more about um, the Salem Church. But during the first Battle of Fredericksburg, it'll be full, filled with refugees from the town who came out here. And during the second Battle of Fredericksburg, um, sorry, the, the second battle of Fredericksburg after it, and we have this battle at Salem Church, this will be used as a hospital, and this will be a big hospital scene out here. So to kind of set the stage for, for the Union attacks out here, I'm going to bring on Dan Davis. We have the Federals moving in this direction off from my right, off to my left. We have Confederates moving into this position who will kind of set up behind this ridge line and surprise those Yankees. But in the between, we have this ridge, we have Wilcox, and we have Bully Brooks, and they're all coming together. Thanks, Chris. Hey there, everyone. And to pick up where Chris left off, as you mentioned earlier, Cadmus Wilcox and his Alabamans have been fighting a delaying action, delaying the Sixth Corps coming out of Fredericksburg westward along the Orange Turnpike. As Wilcox reaches this area, as Chris mentioned, there are already prepared works up here. They were prepared back during the winter of 1862-1863 by George Pickett's division. Again, this is high ground west of Chancellorsville. 
or, and east, or east of Chancellorsville, west of Fredericksburg, and of course if the Confederates get driven out of Fredericksburg, this is an ideal place to fall back to. Up here and uh, behind the church will be the 10th Alabama Infantry. Over in what is now the uh, parking lot and a Chick-fil-A restaurant, backstopping them is the 9th Alabama. We have the 8th Alabama off to the south. Now as, or south as below the church. As Brooks is coming up and onto the field, he's going to begin deploying his brigades. Henry Brown's New Jersey Brigade, the famous New Jersey Brigade, are going to deploy north of the Orange Turnpike, extending on the, to the opposite side of the road is the 23rd New Jersey Infantry. I'm going to ask Sarah to pan over to the left, look down the ridge, and you can see one of those new monuments that Chris mentioned earlier to the 23rd New Jersey. Filling in the line off to the south, is Joseph Bartlett's brigade next to the New Jerseyans, to the left of the New Jerseyans, uh, deploying out here roughly beyond where the modern Salem Church is located. It's Emory Upton's 121st New York Infantry. I'm going to talk more about Upton in just a few minutes. And then beyond the 121st New York is the 96th Pennsylvania and the 5th Maine. The, now, getting back to the 121st New York and Emory Upton, he's a rather well-known Civil War officer, an officer who's gotten a lot more attention over the course of the last five to six years. There's been a new biography written of Upton. His papers have been published. His letters, the letters to his uh, wife have also been published as well. I, when I think about Emory Upton, for you Big Bang Theory fans out there, I think about Sheldon Cooper. I think he's the Sheldon Cooper of the Army of the Potomac. He's very, very awkward, very socially awkward, but he's a very, very smart and intelligent individual. He's from Batavia, New York. He is a, a rather staunch abolitionist. He attended Oberlin College prior to the war, gets into West Point, graduates in the class of 1861 at West Point. He serves on the staff of Daniel Tyler at the Battle of First Manassas in July of 1861. And for the first year or so of the war, he's an artillery commander. He's going to take over command of the 121st New York in the fall of 1862. He gets promoted to the rank of colonel and the 121st New York very soon will become known as Upton's Regulars, a nod to Upton's professionalism, the discipline that he instills into his men, and odd to the U.S. regular regiments serving in the Army of the Potomac. They're going to see a little bit of action at Fredericksburg, but their baptism of fire is going to come here on this field at Salem Church. Now, I'm going to ask Sarah to pan over to the left once again. You'll see where the modern Salem Church is located. At the time of the battle, as much as this battlefield has been lost to time and lost to development, there was a massive woodlot out here in this area. And as the New 2030 New Jersey, the 121st New York advance up this slope, they're going to begin encountering skirmishers from the 61st Virginia Infantry from Billy Mahone's brigade on the opposite side of the eastern side of that woodlot. The New Yorkers are going to begin driving the Virginians back into the woodlot. Then they're going to start encountering Cadmus Wilcox's Alabama, the 8th Alabama, 10th Alabama skirmishers. And they're going to get somewhat pinned down in that woodlot. Upton's going to give the order to fix bayonets, and they're going to begin moving out of that woodlot up and to the crest of this ridge where they're going to encounter the 10th Alabama infantry up here around the church. Now, when I said that this was the 121st New York's baptism of fire, it most absolutely is. They're going to lose six color bearers during their advance. Upton is a very obstinate commander, very stubborn commander. He gets up here onto this crest and he doesn't want to give it up, but the pressure is too great. His line is essentially, uh, the Confederate line off to his left is essentially going to overlap his own line, overlap the Pennsylvanians and the 5th Maine off to his left. Federals are going to try to punch through the position up here by sending the 16th New York from the rear around the 23rd New Jersey and into the roadway to try to break through the Confederate position here between the 10th Alabama and the 11th Alabama, which is located over in the modern shopping center. The New Yorkers, the New Jerseyans, they cannot break through Wilcox's line. In fact, Upton is going to lose on this battlefield 276 men killed, wounded, and missing out of 453 he brings on to the field. Eventually, he's going to have to give up the fight and pull his men out and off of this ridge and withdraw back toward the modern Spotsylvania town center, what we used to know as the Spotsylvania Mall. Now, taking Upton's story just a little bit farther, 
I mentioned that he had commanded artillery early in the war. He commands infantry here. He's going to command infantry more, most famously on May 10th, 1864 at Spotsylvania Courthouse. We talked a little bit about these attacks in one of our earlier videos. We were talking about the fighting at 2nd Fredericksburg. He's going to uh, launch a column assault that will break through temporarily the Confederate line at the Mule Shoe Salient, but he's going to end the war, in fact, as a cavalry commander. For those of you who are familiar with the Vicksburg campaign, Upton, after being wounded at the Battle of Third Winchester, upon his recovery, he's going to be called west by James Wilson to take over command of Benjamin Grierson's division. So Upton's going to be, uh, he will command all three major combat branches during the Civil War. His last assault of the Civil War is going to come with dismounted cavalry attacking the Confederate positions at Selma, Alabama in the spring of 1865. And now I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague Chris White. Sarah, I'm going to have you move over here just a little bit and kind of point off in this direction. We know we have a, a few buffering issues. I have no idea how. We have three cell phone towers nearby, but somehow we're having a little uh, buffering issue. This will uh, stay up on the internet. Those are all clear up here in a little bit, so don't worry about that. If you're watching it live, you can just go back and watch it a little bit later. Um, somebody asked, you know, how do you get three one and one with Robert E. Lee? Three victories, seven days, second Manassas campaign, Fredericksburg, Antietam's a tie. Everybody forgets that Robert E. Lee fought in West Virginia and he lost that campaign and it didn't go well for him because he almost lost his entire job with the Confederacy. So that's how he's three, one and one in the war. When he goes out of here, he'll be four, one and one on the way up to Gettysburg. Um, so that, that's how we'll do that. Um, to tie in a little bit of what Dan said, so we have this union kind of wall coming towards us. Uh, on the north side of the road, we will have Colonel Brown and his New Jersey Brigade. They'll be uh, broken up into different pieces. The first and third New Jersey will be coming up towards the Faith Baptist Mega Church in that vicinity into a wood line when they make contact with Paul Sims and his brigade. Paul Sims is commanding a Georgia Brigade out here. He'll uh, uh, be mortally wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg two months from now. But Sims, when he came out to the Battle of Chancellorsville, had fought a lot um, at Chancellorsville. His men fought on May 1st, May 2nd, May 3rd. That morning, they had captured most of the 27th Connecticut. And then they rode out here to do more fighting. So uh, pound for pound, Lafayette McClaws' division is really, really um, uh, doing a lot of fighting out here. But when Sims comes out onto the field, I would have loved to have seen him. He has a turban on his head. He's got a big red sash around his, uh, around his chest. He's got polished boots, white pants. He is sticking out um, when he's out on this battlefield. But his men will be to the north of us on the far side of the road, and they kind of turn a little bit outward. Um, and that means that they're catching the first New Jersey on their flank. So as the first New Jersey and third are coming like this, the first sees someone's firing at them from this direction, and they do this. They turn, and they start going in that way. The third New Jersey, starts going this way, and that creates a gap. Up into that gap will hopefully come the 15th New Jersey, seeing their first battle ever. And as they start coming up into action, some of the men behind them will start to scream at them, drop your backpacks, drop your backpacks, because they had still been carrying their knapsacks before they went into action. Some of the men will have problems loading and firing their muskets. Um, there were some, some issues with some of their muskets, it, it seemed like. Some of the men are jamming their ramrods up against trees to get them to, to go off. But this would have been all woods that they would have been fighting with on the north side of the road. Here, where Dan was describing, the 121st New York will actually come up through here. There was an old schoolhouse about 60 yards to the south of us. They'll engulf that, they in the 5th Maine and 96th Pennsylvania, and they will push past the Salem Church. In fact, there were Alabamians, I think from the 10th Alabama, in here firing out the windows off in that direction. They turned it into a little fortification. For a brief time, those Alabamians will become prisoners. But out on the road, you might see that large monument that, that Dan pointed out. That is the 23rd New Jersey Infantry. They have one of my favorite nicknames. They're the Yahoos um, of the 23rd. They're led by Edward Bird Grubb. Grubb will lead them out here into this battle. This is their first and really only battle with the Army of the Potomac. And as they come up onto line, they're actually blocking Jewel Seaver and his veteran two-year regiment, the 16th New York, who get who Seaver gets upset, swings his men up into the road, forward, and then redeploys them, kind of cutting off the 23rd, saying, get out of the way, rookies. 
Um, but some people had some, some issues with the 16th New York going into battle at all. They were worried because this would have been their last battle. Would they do their duty? Their enlistments are about to run out. But they did their full duty out here. And in fact, the chaplain for the 16th New York is, a, uh, is awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions out here. The best way I can describe his actions, if you watched uh, episode three, A Band of Brothers, there's a scene in Carentan where they talk about uh, where um, I think it's Muck and Bill Garnier look out and see a, 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 a chaplain who's out in the middle of the Germans in the American lines just giving absolution to men under fire. And that's what happens out here with that chaplain of the 16th New York. But the fighting itself will push forward. They'll actually go onto the far side of the ridge for a moment because the Confederates have what we call a reverse slope defense going on here. Uh, British loved using this during the Napoleonic Wars. You put a, a, a small hill in front of you and when the enemy crests that hill, they're gonna be at a point blank range and you could fire right into their knees. You wanna see the, the most famous reverse slope defense of the American Civil War? Go to the sunken lane at Antietam. That is where Robert Rhodes, John Brown Gordon and others fought. That's a reverse slope defense. So the New Yorkers, New Jerseyans, we've got all kinds of guys coming up into here and now the Confederates start to counterattack. Cadmus Wilcox knew that he had help. He knew that the, the more Confederates were coming. And one of the reasons he has this reverse slope defense is because he told them to stay back there, stay out of sight. Let's draw in these Yankees. And that's exactly what happens. And now they will start to counterattack these Confederates. And as they do so, they're gonna start pushing back. They'll recapture the Salem church. At one point, someone will have to be sent up to the front to relieve uh, Emory Upton because Upton refuses to, to leave. Someone says the order is to, re to withdraw. Damn you, don't you have enough sense to withdraw? And finally, the 121st New York withdraws out of here. The woods to the south of us are on fire. There's smoke coming up um, and the Confederates are starting to rush forward. And I wanna switch off with uh, Sarah Byerly here for, for a moment. Sarah has a uh, an account with one of these soldiers with the 14th, uh, 14th uh, Alabama, who served up here as part of Cadmus Wilcox's brigade. Now I'm going to bring on Tim Talbot from the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust. He's going to talk about um, uh, one of the Georgia units up in this area, and we'll we'll uh, uh, talk more about those Confederate sides. And then I want to point out the two monuments that we have out here that we haven't visited yet, and we're not visiting one of them because we got to cross six lanes of traffic. Thanks, Chris. Um, so we are out here on the ridge of Salem Church, and as Chris was just describing, um, we have Confederates that are using the reverse slope. And one of the regiments that is in Wilcox's command and located on the opposite side of the Turnpike or Modern Route 3 is the 14th Alabama. And a few weeks ago, I happened to be doing some research. It's sometimes really fun how coincidences happen. And I realized that this was a really amazing collection that had been digitized from the Alabama State Archives. And it's a set of family letters related to a soldier named Francis Dannelly who fights here at the Battle of Salem Church. And his story does not have a happy ending, but what we find in the letters is really interesting, and I'm hoping that you'll find it meaningful as well. So Francis Dannelly is 32 years old. As I mentioned, he's in the 14th Alabama um, Infantry, and I think he has some relatives in the regiment as well. Definitely one of his wife's cousins is fighting with him. And on May 9th, so six days after the fighting that happens here at Salem Church, Sergeant W.S. Hooper writes a letter to Elizabeth Dannelly, Francis's wife, who's back in Alabama. And he writes to her because he's received a letter that she's written to her husband. And he says, it is with great dissatisfaction to me to have to pen you these few lines in a way that involves on me to do nonetheless. True, it has been the will of God to call your devoted husband from this low land of sorrow to a world on high. He was killed on Sunday the 3rd of May on the battlefield while we was making a charge on the enemy. As you would like to hear the particulars of his death, I take it in hand to inform you. He was shot through the heart and died instantly. We buried him the next morning decently. We got a box and buried him in it. Your letter came to hand yesterday. 
I will enclose it to you in this. My deep sympathy rest and abide with you forever. Believe me to be a true friend. And then he closes the letter. Um, he adds a few more notes about the overall casualties of the regiment and says that he hopes he's not intruding in her grief by giving that information. So Sergeant Hooper writes this letter and is returning one of Mrs. Dannelly's letters to her on May 9th, 1863. The following day, May 10th, 1863, in Alabama, Elizabeth sits down to write another letter to Francis. She has no idea that he has been dead for a week. Um, from the correspondence and from some other Alabama soldiers who lived in a similar area and are writing about this time, letters seem to be taking about 10 days to two weeks to travel from this area of Virginia back to their area um, of Alabama. So she sits down to write a letter to let her husband know the news of what's happening in the family in Alabama. She tells him about all the family's health. They evidently have at least two children. She writes about children. She writes about them in plural. Um, so she's commenting on the children and what's happening. Um, she tells them about what their friends are doing. And then um, she says, She's talking about how important it is to her to be sending supplies and things to her husband as he's in the army. She says, it is a pleasure to me to send anything for I know a soldier's life is a rigid one and I hope our kind maker may smile on you that you may all return to your fond embrace and loved ones at home, but the prospect look gloomy now. She does seem to leave out some words as she writes, and I've tried to transcribe it as faithfully as possible. She goes on and says, I received your kind letter last evening, which was dated the 16th of April. I was more than glad to receive it, for I was getting out of heart of not hearing from you anymore. I was getting out of heart of hearing from you anymore when I can't. Uh, you get low-spirited and can't help it. I was glad you got your hat, for I hear you was without it, and it troubled my mind. She makes this reference to his hat, and then the letter file continues. It's in, on May 20th, 1863. Presumably this letter that she wrote on May 10th has now arrived in the camp of the 14th Alabama because another soldier, another comrade of her husband, says he's got a letter He's returning it to her. So he writes, your letter came to me. I will send it back as he is gone, gone forever and forever. I wish that some of you would come or send and get him and take him home. For it was his desire to be carried home if killed in the war. I never saw him after he was killed. I have his blanket and hat. I want to send them home the first chance. Uh, if I don't lose them. Somebody robbed him before they went to get him and cut his pockets out. So what has remained from her husband's body when he was found by his comrades is his blanket and his hat, presumably the same hat that his wife had sent him a few weeks earlier. There were more letters in the file. About a year later, in April 1864, a man named William Welch, who seems to have been a friend of the family, he's mentioned in some of these previous letters, um, he writes to Elizabeth Dannelly and says that he has recovered her husband's body from Salem Church Battlefield and that he is bringing several other Alabama corpses back to their families and he's bringing her husband home to her. And he's making these arrangements and again, he's referencing this wish that Francis Dannelly had evidently told his comrades that he wanted to be buried at home. On the 27th of April, 1864, um, some friends, possibly neighbors of the Dannelys, um, they are writing to their son, who is also um, serving in the Confederacy. He says, Welch landed home the 22nd past, this is now April, 1864, with F. Dannelly's remains, he was buried. Um, I feel certain that he got the right body, for they cut the name off his pants. His company wanted him brought and said that it should be done. So this is the story of a soldier in the 14th Alabama 
who fights out here, who's wearing probably a special hat sent to him from the home front. He's killed out here in the fighting on May 3rd, 1863, and nearly a year later, his remains are taken home to his family. As for his wife, Elizabeth, there's one more piece of paper that I found that tells a little bit more about her story. With the help of William Welch, who had also helped to bring her husband's remains home, um, she files an application on August 17th, 1864, to the Confederate Treasury asking for her husband's back pay. She can't ask for a pension as a Confederate widow, but she can ask for his back pay. And the specific amount that she was owed was $69.74. I was not able in my short research time to figure out if she was ever granted that back pay, but hopefully she was. And I mentioned this story because it's one thing to be sitting at a research desk and come across these letters, in this case digitized, and you know be able to start piecing together this story. But when you sit there and you think about 32-year-old Francis Danley, his wife and children are hundreds of miles away from here. He's wearing this hat, he's got this blanket, and he's killed out here somewhere on these fields. And we talk in the, in the large scheme of military history, which is important, about the lines of troops and the brigades and the divisions and how people moved, and that's absolutely important. But these battle lines were made of individuals, and individuals whose lives were impacted by what happened. And not only do, so Francis Stanley loses his life here in the fighting on May 3rd, and his family is also going to be impacted. His wife is a widow, his children have lost their father. So, and as we think about these type of stories, and as we stand here at Salem Church Battlefield, which is just unfortunately a postage stamp of preserved land, we can think about the importance of sacrifice. We can think about the loss that happened in these places and we can kind of look around and think, I hope in the future that battlefields remain more preserved, that there's more land to see than we have here at Salem Church Ridge. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And I, th I think it's important to touch on what you're, you're saying about the preservation aspect. Uh, even if you're not out here for history, these are green spaces in an ever-growing area down here in uh, central Virginia. I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, people uh, influxes from other parts of the country, Fredericksburg, other places. These are our big green spaces for folks who legitimately don't have a backyard. Um, you know, so if that gets someone out here to enjoy a bicycling or, you know, have a meal or picnic or whatever, and they go read a sign and that gets them engaged with history, that's a, that's a big benefit to us. And, and uh, after I bring on Tim and, and we close up, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the preservation efforts out here at Salem Church, and they started all the way back in 1924, and I'll give you a, a, a glimpse of what the federal government thought should be preserved out here as far back as 1924, and then I'll point out our other, our, our other two monuments. So I'm going to bring on Tim Talbot, and uh, Tim's with our friends at the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust who are based here in Fredericksburg. Um, so if you haven't heard about the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust, be sure to go check out their website, cvbt.org. Um, you can check out our other videos, which we have uh, some content in there from them earlier this week. Um, and as I bring on Tim, I just want to say hi to Chris from Vlogging Through History. It's good to see you on here. Um, he's got a great channel if you haven't checked that out. Um, we also see somebody who had a, an ancestor in the 16th New York um, who was on here, a Chris Mikowski sighting. Uh, so it was, uh, there's a lot of people who are uh, on the feed right now. So Tim, uh, tell us a little bit about what you have in store for us. Thanks, Chris, and uh, thank you guys for viewing today and uh, checking in with us. Uh, thank you for donating your money toward battlefield preservation. And one of the reasons that uh, the sites that we've been going to today have become known as Chancellorsville Forgotten Front is because of the lack of preservation at these sites. It's really hard to develop a historical empathy if you don't have a good idea of what it looked like. And when all this development encroaches on what were once hallowed grounds, uh, that doesn't mean that they're not hallowed ground still, but it makes it very difficult for people to understand or appreciate, uh, want to study even, uh, if it's been uh, developed since then. So CVBT being a regional partner with ABT, um, we've been successful in trying to preserve a number of these acres around Fredericksburg and in Spotsylvania County that have to deal with what we've been talking about today. In an earlier video, we shared some over at Willis Hill, which was eight acres that was saved back in 1996 and 1997. Um, 
We've also been able to put in a historic easement on 18 acres at Brayhead, which was part of Howe's division fighting down there with New Jersey troops and with Vermont troops and with some of those Mississippians. Uh, and then also, uh, along with that, this past year, we were able to help downtown Green save 56 acres, same guys fighting down there on that southern end of the second ba Fredericksburg battlefield as well. And then some of the fighting on May 4th that we really forget about over at Smith Run, the Vermont Brigade fighting there. Um, four of those men are going to receive the Medal of Honor for their heroism uh, on the 4th. So those acres have been saved by CVBT uh, and our generous donors. Um, well, of course, I'm speaking to the choir uh, when I mention uh, this hallowed ground. One of the reasons that we preserve this is really um, emphasized in this comment that was made by Colonel Robert McMillan of the 24th Georgia uh, here at Salem Church. He said, quote, the spacious yard was literally covered with wounded and dying. The sight inside the building for horror was perhaps never equaled within so limited a space. Every available foot of space was crowded with wounded and bleeding soldiers. The amputated limbs were piled up in every corner, almost as high as a man could reach. Blood flowed in streams along the aisles and out the doors. Screams and groans were heard on all sides while the surgeons with their assistants worked with knives, saws and sutures, bandages to relieve or save all that they could from bleeding to death. So hearing those comments from the people that were here and witnessing that really helps us emphasize this need to reserve battlefields. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for continuing to give. Thank you for going out on the battlefields, learning about children, your relatives. Uh, we can't spread the word enough. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. And if you want to check out Central Virginia Battlefields Trust at cvbt.org, um, you can learn more about them. Dan, I'm going to ask you to hand the camera over to Sarah just for a minute there. I want to give a shout out to Terry Eustace, who, uh, who made a donation here on YouTube. We really appreciate that. That helps us to bring these, these streams to you. Um, and I, I figure I'm going to wrap up. Anyone have anything they want to add? All right. So what I want to do is just talk uh, about a couple uh, quick items. Uh, number one, let's talk about the preservation out here. Um, Tim just, just brought that up. In 1924, there was a congressional study put together to uh, decide if they should preserve the battlefields down here in the Spotsylvania County area. Um, after they had come through here, this congressional study, they said the report estimated that 535 acres would be sufficient to accomplish the effort of creating a park. That's 275 acres at Spotsylvania, 100 acres at, Sp at the wilderness, or I'm sorry, 150 acres at the wilderness, and 110 acres around Fredericksburg. All the sites where trenches on the main battle line are sufficiently well preserved to warrant retaining in their present condition. The report did not recommend any land to be considered at Chancellorsville or Salem Church. Think about that. Uh, considering the unlikeliness of a development out in this area, they figured that this would always be farmland. We had two different ways that we would preserve battlefields back in the day, and this was the Antietam Plan versus the Chickamauga Plan. Chickamauga comes first. Chickamauga is the first national military park. We go in as the federal government. We want to save 8,000 acres. We save a little more than 5,000 because land speculators got wind of what we were up to. They go down to Fort Oglethorpe in Georgia, buy up the land, raise the prices. Government doesn't like this. Enter George Davis, or Davies. Davies is a uh, uh, Civil War veteran. He fought at Antietam. I think it was the 16th Connecticut he's with. He is still in the Army, and he's working for the War Department, and he wants to save the Army money. So he goes to Antietam and said, hey, look, it's always farmland out here. We can buy a road, we can buy a 20-foot easement off of either side, and it will always be farmland. Farmers take care of the land, we have these nice roads, there's your battlefield. So the Antietam plan was buy as little as possible, and that's how these battlefields were established. Eventually, the, um, eventually, the federal government wised up and, and decided that yes, Chancellorsville should be preserved. And by 1932, 2,100 acres had been purchased in this area. Um, but that was not nearly enough. There were four battles, 100,000 casualties in this area. And today, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park is more than 7,500 acres. Um, and a large unit is Chancellorsville. So we were working from behind the eight ball as preservationists as far back as 1924. 
Um, the folks at the, the Salem Church, they saw to it that the church itself was saved and preserved and given to the American people uh, to be taken care of in perpetuity. But we have less than three acres here at the Salem Church battlefield. It, it's a, a postage stamp, if you will. But it does have two more memorials, and we're not going to move because we, we know we'll have buffering issues. So I'm going to ask Sarah to bring up a, uh, a postcard or two. I collect historic postcards. Um, and we also have some pictures, but we have two monuments. One is to the 15th New Jersey. The 15th uh, served uh, throughout the Eastern Theater in 1863, 64, 65. And they have two monuments on the battlefields down here at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. One is at, at the Bloody Angle at Spotsylvania, where they fought on May 12, 1864. The other one is here, and it's actually over across the street behind, uh, in front of Powell's Furniture. Recently, the National Park Service has made it more accessible. If you're coming out this way, you can actually see the monument. But the 15th monument originally was proposed in 1906, and it was uh, estimated to cost $6,500. The final cost, though, skyrocketed to $20,000. To put that into 2021 numbers, the last time I crunched these, that is uh, $600,000 that monument cost in its own day. And it was dedicated on May 12, 1909, the same day that they dedicated the monument down at Spotsylvania Courthouse. The other monument that's out here is to the 23rd uh, New Jersey. And, and um, it's a really interesting monument. It sits along the north side of, east, uh, of uh, uh, eastbound Route 3. And the monument had stairs coming up from the road at one point. So you could park along the road. You can't do that today. Walk up to the monument. You could see it has a, a bas relief of Edward uh, Bird Grubb, the colonel of the regiment. And Grubb, whose family was well-to-do prior to the war and after the war, um, he is uh, very philanthropic when it comes to preservation issues. In fact, he's a, a colonel of the 23rd New Jersey, goes on to lead the 37th New Jersey down the road. And he gives uh, to the Ladies Memorial Association in Fredericksburg to help preserve the Confederate graves there. He's one of the first uh, Union officers to do so. And when they installed this monument in 1906, it cost about $6,000. And because uh, Grubb um, had to put a monument up and the government doesn't own this land, he had to buy the land and then put the monument on it. And that's how a lot of the monuments were placed at, at Gettysburg and other, other places. It's gonna be these veterans coming in, buying a small piece of land from a farmer, putting in the monument, and that's how they'll memorialize it out here. Um, and if you get a chance to come out here, you can walk down to the 23rd, you can walk over to the little interpretive area over here, see the two other monuments, the 15th New Jersey, do not cross this street. It's pretty dangerous. To close off, I just wanna look back at Salem Church for a moment. And Salem Church on the evening of May 3rd went from a battlefield into a hospital. Um, to close off the story, Robert E. Lee now has the Union Army in one position around the ch north of the Chancellorsville Crossroads. And he has another portion of it boxed up against the Rappahannock River near Banks' Ford. That'll be the bulk of the Union Sixth Army Corps. And Lee has a decision to make. My army split, Hooker's army split. What do I do? He decides to focus on the 6th Corps, destroy it, before it can slip back across the Rappahannock River, or, and then he will turn on Hooker at Chancellorsville. Well, Lee, at this point, his army's pretty much played out. It's May 4th. He has no Corps commanders. He's acting as a Corps and an Army commander at this point. Jeb Stewart has had to take over the Confederate 2nd Army Corps, so he's just new to command. There's no one here in charge of the 1st Corps troops. And when he tells the Confederate division commanders to coordinate amongst themselves to destroy this 6th Corps, they can't do it. And Lee arrives down in the Salem Church area himself. Uh, wounded soldiers from both North and South talk about him coming down here. They see Lee and he's in a wicked temper, according to some men, um, because he, he wants to attack the Federals and he's unable to coordinate. And John Sedgwick's able to slip across the Rappahannock River, and eventually Joe Hooker's able to slip across the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers and get out of Dodge as well. And Lee misses an opportunity, he thinks, at Salem Church. And in a way, I think the Battle of Salem Church helped to save Robert E. Lee's army. Before this battle, Lee was about to throw 35,000 worn-out Confederates up against a fixed fortified position that was just brimming with artillery. It would have been 
a Herculean task. There was no way to flank them like a Jackson had done. All it would take was grit and frontal assaults, and the Federals had fresh troops ready to go in at any moment. Unfortunately for Lee, he doesn't have those fresh troops at hand. So when he turns down in this direction, in some ways, Joe Hooker may have saved, and John Sedgwick may have saved the Army of Northern Virginia from itself. Also down here will be a guy named Daniel Holt. He is the uh, uh, surgeon of the 121st New York. Holt gives us a fantastic diary of spending time here in Salem Church, doing, doing um, uh, surgeries, and meeting a George Todd. George Todd, you might know the last name Todd, Mary Todd Lincoln. Her maiden name was Todd. Her brother's here with Joseph Crashaw's South Carolina Brigade, and he is a surgeon. And Holt sits down with George Todd, and Holt basically says that this guy's really full of himself, but he has nothing nice to say about the First Lady of the United States, his sister. Um, I forget exactly the terminology that he used to describe his sister, but it wasn't positive. But if you get a chance to come out here to Salem Church, just to give you an opportunity to walk up, see the church itself, look in the windows. If it's open, be able to go inside. You'll see battle damage, especially on the eastern side and the southern side of this building. That's battle damage from May 3rd, 1863. And this was one of those forgotten uh, actions here at Chancellorsville. So if you've been following along with our 160 coverage, we got a lot more for you. We will have videos starting tomorrow of Stonewall Jackson's wounding. We'll cover the actions around the Chancellorsville crossroads at places like Hazel Grove, Fairview, and the crossroads themselves. We'll have other guests on with us. We'll have the guests that we had here. We'll have others like Stuart Henderson, Greg Mertz, Don Fonz. We'll have a gaggle of us out at these places. So we hope that you'll subscribe on YouTube. Hit that like button on Facebook and that you will head over to battlefields.org to learn more about what we do. And on behalf of Dan Davis, Tim Talbot, and Sarah Byerly behind the camera, I'm Chris White. I want to thank you for watching, and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.